during the talk, you can ask me in the chat and uh, we'll relate the questions. If, well, we'll try to answer if possible and otherwise we'll uh, relay the questions to Shurshandu directly. We should do a break after 30 minutes where you can ask some questions. And um, at the very end of the talk, we'll stop all recordings um, so that you can ask questions with your mic if you want. In the meantime, if you don't want to be uh, have your face on internet, please just turn off your uh, um, your camera and uh, your mic. Um, just a reminder, this is I'm going to be giving a course in three parts. So there's obviously today and then uh, tomorrow and Friday, the classes will be at 12 p.m. Eastern time, meaning one hour and 30 minutes earlier than uh, now. So um, after this brief uh, technical introduction, um, I'm very happy to introduce Shushan Ganguly from uh, Berkeley. And uh, he's going to give uh, us a mini course on large deviations for random networks and applications. So. OK, so should I start? Um, so OK, let me try to sort of share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so this is visible, right? Okay, uh, sometimes Zoom might freeze and so I might be writing and things might not be updating. So if, if you think that it's been too long without sort of seeing any change, you should point that to me and then I should try to do something about it. It should be fine, but sometimes it does that. Uh, um, okay, uh, yeah, so thanks a lot for the and to the organizers for the invitation and it's like a great sequence of topics um, throughout the summer. It's a great way to keep everybody sort of excited about something amidst all this sort of grim circumstances. So what I'll talk about is a topic that has seen a lot of activity recently and it's sort of has to do with large deviations for some canonical nonlinear functions of independent random variables. And so I'll try to give a broad sort of overview of some of the progress, um, including some of my own work. Um, but there's so many new results coming up every day. It's sort of hard to keep a tab on everything. So if I sort of, uh, if you think that there is something that I should be mentioning and I am missing somehow, so you should feel free to point that to me. I'm also sort of typing up some lecture notes. Um, um, so it's, it might have some typos. It's been rather quick, but I'll, I'll, I'll sort of send them to the organizers after today's lecture. and. They will contain a super set of what I'll sort of talk about um, today and, and over the next few lectures. Um, okay, um, good. Okay, so large divisions for random networks and applications. So, so let's sort of start with the motivating sort of question. Um, so let's start with an idea of random graph. So, so this is a random graph. I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with this, but just to sort of keep things concrete. On n vertices, where every edge occurs independently with probability p. OK, so, so you have some big random graph. Uh, and now let's fix some subgraph H. So some, some fixed graph H. Mm, you can think of it as a triangle. So mm, for the moment, consider just K3 or a triangle. Uh, this is a complete graph on three vertices. And the object of interest is let's say XH, the random variable which is uh, the number of copies of H in the random graph G. Okay, so G is a random graph and I look at the number of triangles in, in G. Um, so I mean, it's pretty easy to compute what expectation of XH is. And that's just, uh, I'm looking at, let's say labeled triangles, so then it's just um, I'm like up to smaller terms, it's n cube, p cube. And so the question of interest or the motivating question is the following. So I just wanna, I wanna understand um, atypical behavior uh, of this random variable. So in particular, I, I want to understand uh, probability of events like the following.
So delta is some positive, fixed, let's say fixed uh, number. So XH is typically like expectation XH. So people know a lot about it. So there is, it sort of satisfies the central limit theorem and whatnot. And so it's sort of really concentrated typically around expectation of XH. Um, and I want to understand sort of atypical behavior. And so this actually goes by the name and has been sort of studied for a while now. Uh, coined by Janssen and Roshinsky in zero two. Okay, so, and another sort of related question is the geometric one. So this is something about computing the probability of a certain event, but I can also ask a more geometric question What does, I'm like, this is gonna be slightly vague at this point. What does a random graph G look like given uh, the event, um, let's call this event for the moment as A given the event A. Like what is sort of a geometric manifestation of this conditioning on this event A? Do you sort of tend to see sort of more, so typically if you have a graph on size N with edge density P, roughly you will have N choose two times P many edges, but maybe if I tell you that the number of triangles is much larger than typical, maybe the number of edges actually become much larger, or there could be some other sort of geometric consequences of this conditioning. So these are roughly the two sort of guiding questions that will uh, dictate whatever I'm gonna be saying over the next few lectures. And, uh, and so, so before sort of, okay, so an, so an observation or just a fact, I'll be more precise soon, but like it's sort of not hard to see that XH is a polynomial Um, of independent Bernoulli variables. So the edges of the graph are independent Bernoulli variables and the number of triangles is in a graph, in this random graph, is roughly a polynomial of degree three in this random variable, in, in all these independent bits. Okay, so any questions so far? Actually, let me just make sure that I am, uh, I sort of, uh, the chat box is visible to me. Okay. Okay. Okay, so, Okay, so this is sort of the question, but let's see um, some sort of classical results about linear functions. So, so the hardness is that this is a polynomial, but let's just sort of um, recall some classical concentration and large deviations result for uh, linear functions. Well, we will look at a very basic setting. So let's first start with um, the zuma hof -Ding. Inequality. So let's say, um, are independent uh, mean zero random variables such that xi is less than 
So let's say I have a sequence of independent random variables such that the ith random variable is between ai and vi for two constants ai and vi, almost surely. So. Okay. So then I want to, let's say, find some concentration estimate for the sum. So Sn, let's say, is the sum of text size. And, and I want to understand, uh, let's say, probability. So Sn, have, of course, has mean zero. Let's, let's say I, I want to understand probability Sn is bigger than T for some T. OK, so this is a very classical thing, and everybody sort of is familiar with it, but let's just sort of just review how to maybe prove such a concentration result. And the, and the method is sort of super classical, but sort of it turns out that even generalization of that will help us understand the random graph question that I started with. Okay, so the strategy is to use, I mean, there are many strategies, so you can use Chebyshev's inequality or whatever, but if you want something stronger, is to compute exponential moments and then apply Markov. Okay. So, I mean, like, for example, like um, this thing is true that expectation of e power theta xi, so theta is some parameter that we will sort of optimize over, that thing is less than e power theta square, bi square minus ai square. Uh, sorry, uh, that's not what I meant. Maybe by an eight. So if you have a random variable xi, which is mean zero and supported on between AI and VI, then you have this upper bound on the exponential moment. Okay. And so let's say, let's call this as maybe CI. So this tells you that expectation of E power theta SN is less than or equal to E power theta square summation CI square by eight. Okay, and now suppose I want to understand what is the probability that Sn is bigger than T. Then I can sort of just, uh, which means that this guy is bigger than E power theta T. So this thing is by Markov less than E power theta square summation C i square by eight minus theta T, right? And this bound holds for uh, all theta. And now I can optimize over theta and then optimize over theta. Right, so the general strategy is you compute exponential moments and then and then apply Markov in sort of an optimal way. Okay, so this gives you just concentration, but now let's look at some um, sort of large deviation. So again, so look, look at the special case where Xi's are kind tosses. So let's say Xi's are all IID Bernoulli P. And, and so, and now let's say I want to understand the probability that Sn is bigger than n times q, where q is bigger than p. So Sn, the sum of xi's is typically like np plus some fluctuation of order square root n. But now let's say I want to understand uh, what is the probability that is super large. Okay, I can sort of write, do the same strategy. So, so let's say lambda theta is the log of this exponential uh, moment generating function, uh, log of the moment generating function. So in this case, it's going to be p times e power theta plus one minus p, right? So if I look at just one bit, e power theta xi is literally this. And so I'm just taking the log of that. So, so if I, if, I, if I follow the same strategy, the bound that I get is e power n lambda theta minus uh, 
n times theta q. So this thing is less equal to this by the same strategy. And okay, again, I can optimize over theta. So, so this is, um, so if I optimize, so, so I can like look at this variational problem, which is let's say theta q minus lambda theta. So the theta that maximizes this, if I plug that in, that's gonna give me the best possible bound here. And it turns out that um, the dual, so this is again, so this is a convex function and this is the Legendre dual of um, this log moment changing function. And it turns out that this is what is known as a relative entropy. So this thing is actually uh, the relative entropy of Bernoulli Q with respect to P, which is nothing but this. Okay, so, so using that, I get the probability Sn bigger than Nq is less than e power minus n ip of q without actually any error. So this is sort of an error free in some sense. Okay, so that's an upper bound, but to get sharp results, you also need a lower bound. And so that's by a standard uh, technique called tilting. So the strategy is to do a change of measure, which makes the atypical event typical. So Sn bigger than Nq is atypical under the product measure where everything is a Bernoulli P was actually pretty typical if everything was a Bernoulli Q. So, so you can sort of, you want to estimate the probability of this event. Mm. You can sort of, instead of measuring the probability of this event under the original measure, you can measure the probability of the event under a new measure, which makes it likely. And then to get back to the original measure, to get back to the original measure, one has to estimate the radon nicotine derivative between the two measures. Right, so I'm mean, like, it just sort of abstractly, so suppose I want to measure uh, the probability of an event A under P. So that's the same as, um, so, so think of some other measure Q and, and it's the same as saying uh, E power log DP DQ, DQ of A. I'm like, I just did not do anything. So E power log DP DQ is literally DP DQ times DQ is DP. So this is indeed P of A but DQ puts a lot of mass on A. And if I can actually understand uh, this, uh, this thing reasonably sharply, then I can get a lower bound. Okay, so the upper bound is by this exponential moment argument, lower bound is by some change of measure and uh, computing the, uh, the radon nicotine derivative. Okay. Okay, so this is sort of, you should sort of keep this strategy in mind and this is something that will come up in our understanding of the events in the graph setting as well. Okay, um, so, so again, back to this random variable XH. So just to sort of concretely XH uh, recall, XH is the number of copies of H in some graph G. So, so just to sort of formalize uh, the notation more generally, so for any graph H and G, let's call T H G. 
as let's say uh, uh, so one over n to the size of the vortex so i'll explain what this is So G is, let's say, a graph on n vortices with adjacency matrix A and H has, let's say, K vortices. So this is, so basically the, this is the num, um, this is essentially the density of the number of copies of H inside G. So, I, so I, I want to map H inside G. So let's say the K vortices of H get mapped to the vortices I1, I2, IK in my big graph G. And then what I want is for all the edges in H to map to some edge in G. And, and A, IX, IY is the IX, IY the entry of the edges matrix of A, which encodes whether in G, there is an edge there or not. So this basically says that what is the probability that, uh, what is sort of the average density of H inside G in principle, in, which means basically if you take a random bijection, what is the probability that it will end up being actually H? Okay. And so to answer the question that, uh, what does the, okay, let's see. So recall the geometry question, what does GNP look like given um, THG is large? Now in the coin tossing example, uh, one thing I should have mentioned here, um, in the coin tossing example, everything is of density P typically, but if I tell you that the sum is actually uh, much bigger than typical and it's NQ, then this essentially indicates, we also have a matching load bound by this tilting strategy, that every coin basically roughly now looks like a Bernoulli cube. So the sort of, in some sense, the optimal strategy for a sum of independent coins to have a large value is for each of them to have a higher density in some sense. Now from that sort of intuition, you can also uh, mm, sort of try to guess uh, what, what the answer to this question is, and, and, and sort of a reasonable guess could be that um, GNP um, continues to look like a random graph it does show any type graph but with different densities. In principle, it can also happen that different edges offer with different probabilities. So it can look like an inhomogeneous random graph. Oh, there are some questions. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh -huh. So I'm um, like, I start with every edge being probability P, but maybe some edges now have probability P1, some other edges have probability P2 in some sort of optimal way so that it makes it likely for uh, the number of copies of H to be large. Okay. Um, and so this is what we will try to establish um, over the course of this lecture. Um, so it will be convenient To, right, so when I'm when I'm saying that it looks like an Edoshwini type graph or it looks like some graph, uh, it's sort of to make sense of this, one has to define some notion of distance on graphs. So, so this is what we will do next. Uh, define a metric on graphs and embed them in the same space.
And so this is a, uh, okay, so a definition. Um, so let W be the set of all symmetric measurable functions from zero one square to zero one. So essentially you have a function on the square, the unit square, which is symmetric and takes values in zero one. So you should think about some, this has some continuum limit um, of graphs. So these are what will be called as graphons. So note that any finite graph naturally embeds in W as a uh, zero one valued step function, right? So I take a graph for any finite graph, there is an adjacency matrix A, right? The entries of the matrices are, uh, it's a symmetric matrix. The entries are zero or one, depending on whether a particular edge is present or not. So it's a, so the, the graph, this matrix is a square of size N by N. Now I can just literally scale everything down to a size zero one by zero one square. And the entries here become small boxes. So, so graph basically, um, it can be identified with a function which looks like this. So these are one by n by one by n squares, and these are zeros or ones, depending on whether the adjacency matrix has a zero or a one, right? So every graph naturally um, embeds into this space. Any questions about this? Oh, can you I, give them? Yeah, I was just gonna mention, there was a question from before the definition about the intuition for in home Right, so it will turn out that it's a, sometimes it's actually not the most optimal thing to, as you will soon see, it's, it's not the most optimal thing to actually raise the density of all the edges because that's very costly. You can actually only affect a small part of the graph to get the required boost. So you can, you can sort of, let's say, put in a bunch of edges, but much smaller than the total number of edges in a very tiny part of the graph in a compact way so that it actually gets you the additional boost in the number of edge counts that you need. Does it roughly sort of answer your question? Like it's not probabilistically always optimal to increase the number of edges because it's very costly. Like it's, there are more optimal ways to actually pack smaller number of edges in a compact form to get the additional boost. Uh, okay. Um, right, so, so this is the space in which we will uh, embed every graph. And now let's define the metric. So for F G, in W, um, so we'll define, so let's, uh, uh, we'll define, let's define this uh, distance between F and G as the following. So you take supremum over all subsets ST, um, sorry. So you take subsets of zero one. And now you basically So essentially you basically take uh, so these uh, so you should think of zero one as your set of vortices. So these are all let's say continuum graphs on the unit interval. So you take two sets S and T. And you look at the difference in the number of edges going between S and T in the graph on F versus the graph on G. And you sort of maximize over all such um, choices of sets S and T. So basically this is known as the cut distance. So essentially what it is doing is it's sort of, look, so two, two, two functions F and G are close in this distance if they're all the cuts are roughly preserved. So the cuts meaning you have two sets and there is a cut between them and you're looking at the number of edges going across them. And this is indeed measuring the difference in the number of edges going across the two sets. Is the definition clear? I guess it's hard to sort of make out, but.
Okay, and okay, and uh, so it also turns out that okay, so since we since uh, we don't care about labels of the graphs, um, we should identify graphs or graphons, which are the same up to a relabeling. So what does that mean? Uh, so precisely it means that let's say sigma is the measure preserving bijection between uh, on zero one. And so then, um, so we say F and G are equivalent if there exist if uh, there exists sigma such that the distance between f and g composed with sigma is zero so so i can sort of so these are functions on zero one square but now i can sort of uh, relabel them and change their labels around so i should sort of think of two functions at the same if they're the same up to some relabeling and so this is what actually quantifies that so this is what we'll, this is the quotient space so, so we'll actually work with the quotient space. So we would work with the quotient space W tilde, where, where do you identify this um, via this equivalence? Okay. Um, now, okay, so, So I want to answer the question of what is the probability of a certain subgraph count being large. I know how to answer this for coin testing experiments. So I want to sort of try to use that strategy to answer this question. So for example, let's look at a slightly easier question. So suppose I have a graph. I will identify the graph with a, a, a square. And let's say I have, I divide it into block graphs, like blocks. So there are four parts, let's say. Right, so I have, I've divided my big, big graph into four parts. Now, typically the density of, so typically the density of edges between A1 and A2 is P. Right, so all of them are roughly p. So this basically, I mean, like if you zoom out, I'm mean, like the actual matrix is zero one valued, but on an average, everything looks roughly like p. Right, so so if you so on an average, everything looks like p. So it turns out that uh, a graph, if you if you take a graph which is g and p sample from GNP, that graph is actually pretty close to the constant function P. Right, so, I, so all my graphs live on the same space. So let's say I sample some n size graph from the measure GNP. The claim is because of what I just said, because on average, the density of edges across any two sets is P, um, the graph, thought of as a graphon is actually very close um, um, to the constant function P, okay? But now I can ask the question, um, so a, a related question is the following.
Oh, sorry. Let me just copy this. Uh, okay. So instead of looking all P, I can actually now, uh, um, okay, so let's, so maybe this looks like P1, this looks like P2, maybe this looks like P3, this looks like P4, and so it's symmetric. So I can actually sort of prescribe different values to different blocks, and I can ask what is the probability that the graph actually looks like this instead of everything being P. And, and notice that this is, exactly the coin tossing problem. Right? So, so my graph is made up of coin tosses, which are all broadly P. Now, suppose I tell you uh, that this looks like P1, which basically means the total number of edges in this is P1 times the total number of uh, possible edges. And similarly, all the other things. So everything was initially P, but now I've sort of prescribed different weights. But this is exactly saying some bunch of coin tosses has a different sum than what its typical value is. Is that clear? If I if I tell you that what is the probability that my original graph looks like this blood graph, it's essentially the same as the coin tossing problem. And and so actually. Um, the probability of this um, using the same reasoning as the coin tossing experiment, as the coin tossing is the following. It's exponential of something like a1 choose two IP of P1 plus A1 A2 IP of P2 and things like that, right? So how many coins are here? It's size of A1 choose two. The number of coins going between A1 and A2 is size of A1 times size of A2. And so, so exactly, and these are all independent. So by this coin tossing experiment, the probability of getting such a weighted block graph is exactly this. Okay. So, um, so going back to our initial sort of guess that telling you that the number of triangles is large makes the graph uh, look like a uh, inhomogeneous random graph it's sort of um, reasonable to try to understand what is the best possible choices of these values such that uh, this new set of values makes the atypical event typical. Okay, so, so this is, so, so again, so, Okay, so, so, so this is sort of the variational problem that I, so this is sum over um, uh, so, so let's maybe, Shandu, you had a question uh, if uh, you meant that all the terms in the exponential were Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so everything, exactly. It's literally the coin-touching experiment, but repeated for every block. 
and their blocks are independent. So the properties sort of uh, are multiplied and each of them is exponential of the minus of the relative entropy. But okay, so I can choose, uh, so I can try to choose, um, different weights, so QIJ says that, okay, so, um, sorry, that's good. So I have my original graph G, uh, which looks like a constant matrix uh, P, but now I sort of, for every IJ entry, I put in QIJ. So Q matrix is the new weighted matrix, is a new weighted graph. Right, so this is the strategy that I'm sort of, I'm extending the previous strategy. So I basically choose all possible weightings of the graph where the ij entry has the new weight qij. The entropy cost is ip of qij. And I want, to, I want to, so the weighting should satisfy that under this weighting, um, the, 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 the number of copies of h inside this new random graph is exactly what I want it to be, which is bigger than one plus delta times the original expectation. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm like, by this strategy, this is the best that you can do. If you can, if you think of everything, if you think of this inhomogeneous random graph as being the actual candidate, then this is the best possible candidate, the Q that minimizes this. Minimum over that. Okay, because the property is gonna be exponential of minus of this. So smaller this is, the higher the property is. So any questions about this? So. Is the best probability one can get by this strategy of uh, considering inhomogeneous random graphs. Okay, so this actually gives you a lower bound in some sense. This is again like a tilting type strategy where I sort of only look at a particular class of graphs these are the inhomogeneous random graphs. And I look at the one which actually makes the property the most, um, which makes it the most likely. The one which has the least amount of entropy cost. Okay. But how does one prove that this is optimal? How to prove, prove that this is indeed the optimal strategy. And this is where, um, uh, and so the key buzzword here is so this is the key result from um, external graph theory, also sort of had many applications in ergodic theory. Um, so this basically says. Mm, that basically any graph um, can be approximated by a, a sort of a, a block random graph. So I'm, I'll be slightly more precise, but uh, sort of roughly, uh, this says any graph can be approximated 
by uh, a block random graph where the number of blocks is only a function of the error and not the size of the graph. So think of every graph. So every graph lives in this graphon space, which is all of unit order. So suppose I take any graph and I want to sort of find, so this basically says that there is a block graph with the number of blocks, let's say only K, so that the distance in this cut norm that I define, the distance between the graph that I started with, an arbitrary graph, and this block graph is gonna be less than epsilon, where the number of blocks, which is K, is only a function of epsilon. Um, so so I'll, I'll say the weaker version of this, so the weak regular dilemma, by Friesen Kanan. Shushandini was a question before. I was wondering, someone was wondering why uh, do we hope that the correct tilting measure should have yeah. independent? Yeah, this is exactly why, because it says basically that every graph looks like a block independent graph. So previously the strategy was to sort of just make a guess and then sort of that will give you a lower one of the probability. That's one of the possible candidates for the new measure. But the regulatory lemma tells you that it is actually will be optimal because actually any graph looks like an inhomogeneous random graph with the number of blocks, which is only a function of the error. Does that roughly answer the question? So let me sort of continue with this and it might be sort of slightly more clear once I sort of state this. So essentially it basically says the following. So given um, uh, any graph, Uh, there exists a partition of V into K classes, A1, A2, AK, such that if you look at this block graph, where um, rho ij, so where, where the ij entry of this block graph is, let's say rho ij. So rho ij is actually So I, I have my original graph g, right? It says basically you can partition the full vortex set V into K classes A1 through AK, so that if you now look at the block graph where um, it has K blocks on each side, where the ijth block has entry rho ij, rho ij is this, is the number of edges going between AI and AJ in my graph G divided by size of AI times size of AJ. This essentially means what the edge density is in my graph G across AI and AJ. So it says that there exists a partition into K classes such that the distance between G, the original graph, thought of as a graph one maybe, and this new block graph, let's call that G quotiented by, um, or maybe let's depend on, quotiented by this partition. So, so this is the partition, let's call this partition as P. So GP is my notation for this block graph. So it says that this error, is no more than order one over root log k. So you see that the graph can be huge, but if I think of it as a function in zero one, and I want to approximate it by something which is like, let's say epsilon, then it suffices to actually partition the graph into a number of blocks where k is such that one by root log k is epsilon. So the size of the graph is actually not very important. The number of blocks only depends on, uh, only depends on the error. Okay, and, and one key thing, one crucial property of this distance 
of the cut distance is the following. That is um, what is known as counting lemma. Meaning that if two graphs are close in this distance, the number of triangles um, uh, between the two graphs will also be the same. So uh, also will be pretty close to each other. So actually, so for any graph H, uh, so here is a statement. So fix H and graph on F and G. Then if you look at the density of H in F minus the density of H in G, that thing is order, which is a function of, uh, it can depend on the cut distance between F and G. So it says that if I, I'm interested in the number of triangles, let's say in my graph G or a function F, and, and, and there is another, uh, another, there is another um, graph on G, which is pretty close to my function F uh, in the cut distance, then the number of triangles in the two graphons are also very close to each other. Okay? So this essentially sort of gives you that this strategy should be right. So, so I, I want to look at the problem of all graphs where the number of triangles is large. The regular dilemma tells me that there is a block graph with not too many blocks, such that this block graph is close to my graph in the cut distance. Which basically means by the counting lemma that the number of triangles in this block graph is also pretty close to the original graph. Okay? And, and so basically it means that you can actually approximate, uh, so plugging using the above, We got a couple of questions, uh, people. So rho is this even if i equals j, and the other one was the other person was wondering if you want to use the contraction principle. Rho is this even if i equal to j. So if i equal to j, then actually you count um, every edge twice. Essentially, it's basically either you count every edge twice, or you here you instead of looking at ai squared, you look at ai choose two, whatever. Like so, basically, it should be the edge density. And the second question is, is it because you want to use contraction principle? At this point, actually, no, because I'm not proving a full large deviation. So what I'm just doing is, I want to just, um, so I already told you how to compute the probability that the graph approximately looks like a block graph. And then the point is, I want to then union bound over all possible block graphs. Using the above, does that actually answer the two questions, roughly? And there is yeah, you're good. Using the above two facts, uh, I can compute the probability uh, that um, G looks like a given given block graph and then union bound over all possible choices of block graphs right so the regular dilemma tells me that it looks like some block graph. Neither do I know exactly what the parts are, nor do I know what exactly the edge densities are. So what I can do is I can actually, because the number of parts is not too large and the edge densities are all between zero and one, I can union bound over all possible choices of block graphs, meaning basically uh, uh, consider all possible partitions of V into K blocks and all possible edge densities rho ij up to an epsilon error. So of course there are infinitely many values of rho ij between zero and one, but up to an epsilon error. So basically you can take zero one and divide it into a mesh of size epsilon 
and you can look at all possible eigenvalues from this mesh value all possible blocks which partition this full set and then for each of such block graphs you can try to use uh, this bound the property that my graph looks like that particular block graph is this and now you can union bound over all possible block graphs and you will see if the union bound is over a uh, not too big set mm, the upper bound one gets is again e power minus whatever i wrote plus smaller or term because remember um, this was the property of any particular block graph and phi h n p delta was the best possible such block graph so all these properties are at most e power minus this now if the union bound is of a smaller order term then this is this will be still dominating the entire union bound even after union bounding over all possible blocks and edge densities and so this is the claim here so the so the point is um this fails if p is going to zero with n faster than a polylog oh sorry and so the or so okay so the so original the full um oh so some of the hmm full the ldp on graphons for no well, it's a, there's a bit of a lag for a fixed p was proven by chatterji and varadhan in 2011 and the argument above which is more commentarial similar but more commentarial uh was by the best kian paris uh so <laughs> i think in 20 maybe 14 2015 maybe yeah so but the point is this union bound uh, becomes too large or the possible choices of densities and the blocks become too large if p is going to zero and this is because um uh, because of this uh, bound so the error that i'm allowing here is one over root log k Yes, yeah, some of my iPad is hanging a little bit. Yeah, so the error that I'm allowing is one over root log k, and it turns out that if p is actually going to zero, then this error must also depend on p, because you see that the number of triangles is like roughly p cube, and so 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 because the error has to then depend on p, then k will become so large that the union bound will actually fail. So this strategy actually sort of is uh, ideal for p constant, but it can be pushed to p going to zero with only logarithmically fast rate, and and it sort of completely fails when p is going to zero for with uh, with as a, as a polynomial in n. And so this is what actually we will um, sort of talk about um, tomorrow and the day after.
but I'll also sort of um, start uh, tomorrow's lecture with um, some discussion on what this quantity looks like. Uh, so, so this is an abstract thing, which is the minimum possible thing, minimum possible entropy cost over all possible inhomogeneous random graphs. Now, as was asked before, uh, why is it not everything becomes uh, from P to some larger value? So it indeed will be the case that for some values of delta and P, this thing is indeed, well, the solution is indeed that everything should be homogeneous with a different value than P. But then there are other values of P and delta uh, for which this is not gonna be the case. And actually the optimal result is not to change everything, but change only some, some parts of the graph. Uh, and so this is what we will start with tomorrow. And then we'll actually talk about how to um, sort of modify the arguments in order to be able to treat um, sparse graphs where P is really going to zero polynomial in the system size. And this naive union bound strategy will not work there. And one has to come up with slightly clever ways to cover your own space uh, so that the total number of things that you are considering is not too big. So I think I'm out of time. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to answer questions, but yeah, I think I'll just stop here, yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, let's give everyone uh, the opportunity to uh, unmute themselves and uh, we'll thank uh, Shu Shendu for this. Uh... So I see a question here and yeah, so basically this result that I presented from Lubetsky Zhao, which uses this big regulatory lemma, uh, the bound, uh, sorry, wait. The whole thing is sort of slightly slow, which is unfortunate. Yeah, so this bound here actually allows you to um, take P to be faster than let's say one over log into the one six or some sort of polylog, yeah. So this, this approach, which is pretty similar to Chatterjee and Varadhan actually allows you to take P going to zero, but only very small.